Welcome everyone to Book at Lunchtime. It's one of Torch's flagship events. We've been operating now since 2013 and we are over 100 books. Many, nearly as wonderful as this book we'll be discussing today. We are delighted to welcome an international panel. One person has arrived from um, Austria, another from Yorkshire, one from, <laughs> one from Oxfordshire, and one from, well, next door, yes. effectively, in, in Green Templeton College. So truly an international panel to discuss authorship, activism, and celebrity. Now, looking through the reviews of this book, it's very, very difficult to find one that sums things up, I think, really. But the one I found, which I thought was particularly relevant, offering a welcome account of literary activism that is historically and culturally diverse from the 18th to the 21st centuries, from England to South Africa to Tamil Nadu. I thought that was very, very impressive. And today we welcome Sandra Meyer and Ruth Scobie and an expert panel, Simon Morgan and Hannah. And Hannah will be our chair for proceedings. And I will, without further ado, I will hand over to Hannah for a wonderful session. There will be time for questions at the end as well, but I will leave it in Hannah's capable hands. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. And thank, thank you, you all for coming. For the, for the invitation to chair today, um, it is uh, an important book which makes this an important event. Um, uh, first, let me introduce the two authors. Uh, Dr. Sandra Meyer is a literary and cultural historian based at the Austri Austrian Academy of Sciences, and she's working on the intersections of literary celebrity, activism, and life writing. Um, and she's joined by the co-editors, co-authors, editors of this book, um, Dr. Ruth Scobie, um, scholar of 18th century literature and colonialism, and she's the author of Celebrity Culture and the Myth of Oceania in Britain in 1770 to 1823. Um, and we are also joined today by Professor Simon Morgan, um, who's head of history at Leeds Beckett University. He specialises in 19th century British history with a particular reference to the histories of radical politics, gender and celebrity. Professor Morgan's research focuses on 19th century political culture in the British Isles and touches on areas including radical politics, gender and the history of celebrity. And he's been a pioneer in the history of celebrity and his research has been credited by a number of scholars around the world with inspiring them to research this area. And I should introduce myself. I'm Dr. Hannah Yellen, uh, reader in media and culture at the uh, other university uh, down the road, uh, Oxford Brooks. And um, yes, I'm also uh, you know, working in the field of, um, well, I, I will explain when I uh, respond to the book, but uh, celebrity, life writing and uh, social change. Um, so the order of business today um, is that we're going to start with, we're very lucky to have Ruth and Sandra, they're now going to take turns to read sections from the book um, and then uh, uh, myself and then Simon will respond, we'll have a little bit of a discussion and then it'll be over to you for questions. So um, please do think of questions um, as they occur to you, please keep them to the end, I'll make sure that we have time uh, to hear them all. Okay, uh, Ruth and Sandra. Okay, um, well first of all, uh, thank you very much to Torch um, for hosting us here today and also for 10 years now more of uh, support for this project um, and particular thanks to Simon and Hannah for, for coming and agreeing to do this um, in the middle of a really busy term. Um, even by the really high standards of academic publishing, this book took a really, really long time to write. Like a really long time to write. Um, Sandra and I have having, been having these conversations, doing kind of this work for more than 10 years, literally met here at Torch um, and started this project here. The first Art in Action Symposium was held in this room in 2016. Um, and then in 2020, uh, almost exactly, um, four years ago, we had everything. We had the, like, the programs printed, ready to go for a two-day conference, which of course um, never took place for reasons that you might be able to guess. Um, and I think at that point, we all kind of assumed that that was gonna be the end of it. Um, and that it didn't, and that there is a book, is basically partly down to Sandra's unbelievable tenacity and her 
capacity to kind of make connections and make friends, um, so many of whom are here today. But it's also because, because of the continuing enthusiasm and the commitment of so many people, again, so many of whom are here today, um, to carry on talking about books and writers and political causes and celebrity, even as the world was sort of falling apart around us. And that includes, you know, all the people who tuned in or contributed to the webinars and our editors at Bloomsbury, especially Amy Martin and Jenny Toya, our incredibly professional and efficient um, editorial assistant, and our peer reviewers who were so quick at getting back to us <laughs> that I, I think Sandra might be a witch. Um, it's possible. Um, but also, of course, all the contributors to the book. Um, there are too many people to name, but I think it all kind of speaks to this idea or this paradox that kept coming up again and again. Slightly to my surprise, as a seasoned cynic, it kept coming up this, this sense that it's at the times when books and writers seem most powerless that talking about them and thinking about them is most urgent and most important and most vital for our continuing survival. That's obviously a much bigger and a more important topic um, and I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to read a bit from the introduction. Fame can provide material conditions which amplify, protect and legitimise vulnerable political voices. Since Dangaremba's visibility on social media, moderate though it is compared to big names like Stephen King, Rupi Kaur or Margaret Atwood, her receipt of prizes and her presence in the news media all helped to promote her work. The economic and cultural capital thus generated can be especially important for writers with otherwise marginalised identities. Dangaremba notes that writing while black and female has always restricted her, quote, access to publication opportunities and avenues to reputable professional publishing houses and lucrative contracts. Her global name recognition may help to redress this, as well as proving a lightning rod for political attacks. At the same time, the perception that a writer welcomes, promotes, or even acknowledges their own celebrity can weaken their claims to artistic or political authenticity. Literary history is littered with accusations of authors selling out, limiting or, or contaminating their art and political commitment in, so in search of money, adulation, or institutional approval. From the epic renegade poet laureate Robert Southey to James Baldwin, whose, quote, voice as a writer was compromised for some readers when he became the official voice of black America. Historically, authors have responded to such criticism, real and anticipated, with everything from gleeful defiance to radical retreat from public life. Most often, they've negotiated between the, the potential costs and benefits of fame in complex and even self-contradictory ways, some of which are outlined in the biographical case studies in this book. Some writers, on the other hand, are vocal about what they see as the artist's obligation to harness her celebrity persona for public good. Bernadine Evaristo, for example, makes a point of embracing celebrities' power to affect change and uplift communities by way of its convertibility into other forms of influence. Winning the Booker Prize has increased my cultural capital, she explains in Manifesto, so that when I have things to say, my audience is much more substantial. Celebrity opens doors and may enable the rebel without to become the negotiator within. A position Ivaristo has exploited in her campaign to increase the visibility of black and Asian writers. Over to Sandra. Right, and before I continue reading from the introduction to this volume, I'd like to say something about another writer who felt very strongly about the author's responsibility to use their public profile in the struggle for inequality and injustice 
and of course whose voice speaks very powerfully through the pages of this book. And uh, of course this was Benjamin Zephaniah, who tragically is no longer with us. Now, of course he was, as we all know, fiercely outspoken, uncompromising, fearless, or as it says in the blurb of his autobiography, political, radical, relevant. We also experienced him as extremely funny, charismatic and accessible. I think we very fondly remember him chatting away to us on Zoom as we were in the midst of a series of lockdowns on the wildlife populating his garden or the trips to Austria he would undertake before the pandemic to practice Tai Chi of all things with his teacher who then happened to live near Vienna. Um, above all, what we sensed with him was a great urgency to be part of the debates in this book on art, literature and their relationship with the wider world. What we also sensed with him was a great passion, commitment and uh, a great generosity. I think it's fair to say that he was extremely generous with his time, with his strong opinions, needless to say, but also with his support of our project, always making us feel that what we were doing was relevant and worthwhile. So we're really hoping that the interview with Benjamin that we were fortunate enough to include in this volume and uh, which you can still watch online on the Torch YouTube channel will stand as a small tribute to an author whose life and work was always inextricably bound up with political activism and uh, who passionately believed in this symbiotic connection of art and action. And I'll continue reading from our introduction now. In his 2018 autobiography, which interweaves a deeply personal story with a larger account of the struggle for racial equality in Britain since the 1970s, poet, performer and activist Benjamin Zephaniah emphasises the writer's responsibility to wield celebrity as a weapon for political activism. His bottom line, he declares in his autobiography, is that you can't just be a poet or writer and say that your activism is simply writing about these things. You have to do something as well, especially if your public profile can be put to good use. A fierce critic of the establishment who famously refused an OBE in 2003, Zephaniah reiterates in the interview for this volume the role of the writer as a visible, politically engaged guide who helps his audience to think for themselves and see the world as it really is. Zephaniah's bold and programmatic statements underline the complex entanglements of celebrity, artistic integrity and political agency. Three concepts which are historically and culturally contingent and unstable in their own right. Although the authors discussed in this volume span countries and periods from 18th century England to 21st century Tamil Nadu, this diversity should not be taken as suggesting that the tensions between literary celebrity and political activism to which they are subject are timeless or universal. Our contention is, instead, that the broad ideas and systems which produce these tensions, essentially a capitalist literary marketplace, and the post-romantic conception of literary authorship are loosely common to the context in which all these authors write and publish and so shape their careers in ways which can be productively compared. Neither literature nor celebrity is a game played outside the real world, untouched by its increasingly all-invasive threats and horrors or its increasingly urgent calls to action. Opening up the conversation to include scholars, writer activists and industry stakeholders, this volume interprets literature as a social and cultural practice fusing politics and economics, art and entertainment, lofty ideals of genius and shrewd self-publicity. In this way, it illustrates the complexity of literature's historically and culturally situated relationship with the world outside the book and shows that concepts of celebrity and political agency can help give a clearer answer to long for questions about whether and how literature makes anything happen. And with these two short extracts, we'd like to hand back over to Hannah and to Simon to, yes, hopefully kick off the conversation and uh, then lead into a general discussion, which we are very much looking forward to.
Great. Well, thank you both for those readings and for the immense amount of work you've put into uh, this important book. Um, now, I've been invited to respond and trace some of the connections uh, with uh, my own work before handing over to Simon to do the same. Um, and as Sandra says, then we'll have more of a free discussion and invite you to join in. Um, so my first book was called Celebrity Memoir from Ghostwriting to Gender Politics. And as you can guess from that title, uh, it was about celebrity and authorship. And I feel like that's one of the reasons I've been invited, so thank you. Um, and I'm sitting down to read this book, and then I realised that my other area of work, which I'd actually never brought into conversation with my first book, um, was also, it was about um, celebrity and activism, in a way. So my, my second book, which actually the manuscript was due with the publisher today, so um, whoops, um, <laughs> that's called Girls, Power and Women in the Public Eye. Um, and it's about the way girls, teenage girls uh, around the UK understand leadership, uh, their own aspirations to make social change um, and who they view as leaders. And I don't think it's a spoiler too much to um, tell you that they view female celebrities as leaders when they give their clout and their profile to progressive social causes. Um, so I realise here I am, I have, I'm doing work on celebrity and authorship. I'm doing work on celebrity and activism. And I have never done work on celebrity, authorship and activism. I've never brought these things together in dialogue. Obviously, in my mind, they were connected by celebrity. Obviously, um, you know, I am thinking of, I have, you know, in frameworks and themes across both of those areas. Um, I, I call my work as about the politics of visibility. And my goodness, does this speak uh, to that theme? Um, but I hadn't considered the celebrity authors, um, there are other different to the ones in here, it's kind of Katie Price and Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian are my celebrity authors. Um, uh, but they do engage in conversations with social causes and I had never thought about those together. And I hadn't really thought about um, the uh, female leaders as defined by teenage girls and the you know, activist or social change work that they're doing in terms of authorship. So we, all of that is to say how important, how, how original um, and how valuable and like now to me reading this, how clear the interpenetration of these things, they're, they're, yeah, it's, an, it's incredibly productive and original um, approach, I think, to these connected themes. So thank you for making those connections um, and doing that work. Um, one of the key purposes, uh, and often one of the most dismissive uh, purposes that people talk about uh, life writing for as, is as being a process of canonization, of shoring up a public image, or rehabilitation, or seeking a favorable reception, or revivifying a career, um, or positioning oneself as relevant to the cultural moment. And I say one because obviously life writing is diffuse. It is, it is much more uh, than that. But nonetheless, that is absolutely a key um, kind of concern uh, with the genre. Um, and of course, activism and social change and connection to causes has been a key means um, for celebrities to do this, uh, to make the case for their goodness. Um, and life writing is a place to capture this. Um, so in a way, actually, I'm seeing that these are two sides of the same thing, even though I'm working in a, in a different kind of scope to this incredibly broad, which has already been mentioned, this incredibly um, broad scope of this book. And it's really funny because, you know, in, in, they are the same thing, but as in, you say in the introduction, despite their absolute inextricable interlinkedness, um, that, that is a relationship that is, in your words, uneasy. It's not, um, you know, it is not straightforward because of these contradictions 
in terms of what are acceptable sources of cultural capital and how do these intervene in hierarchies of cultural value. Um, so many, many of us in the field have uh, theorized fame as a currency. Um, but I think it's really valuable the way that you're pointing out that this is not a currency that all want. Um, it's not a currency that is consistently uh, valuable. Um, it's not always useful, as in the case of, uh, you, you, know, you mentioned Dangaremba's uh, arrest and prosecution. It didn't necessarily prevent that kind of key, key uh, moment. So celebrity is sullied because of the way it makes visible these ties to capitalism which is not how we generate, how we, de how we designate great art, but it's certainly a mechanism by which the choice is made of whose art gets made, supported and distributed. It's, not, it's also not how we designate authority on political and social issues or the direction of social change. Oh, the schadenfreude of attending the numerous uh, uh, tone-deaf celebrity campaigning endeavours and yet, celebrity is certainly and often successfully implicated and mobilised in activist processes. So as um, Ruth and Sandra put it, I pulled out the very quote that you began with. Um, Fame can provide material conditions which amplify, protect and legitimise vulnerable political voices. And as always, we end up talking about authority and authenticity. Um, so the, the book that I'm writing at the moment, that I haven't written, written not writing at the moment, um, asks who gets to say what, on what stage, um, and I think those are questions that this book is, offers actually various answers to. It doesn't just answer that, it offers a number of different answers uh, to those questions. Uh, but it's so much broader than that. Um, so, you know, mainly I've spoken here about the narrow contemporary connection um, to my work, um, which deals with authors who um, <clears throat> wouldn't be considered as literary um, in the highbrow, lowbrow uh, divide. I can be found you know, rolling around in the gutter somewhere. Um, but uh, one of the other things I like about it so much, um, which is a goal I've always uh, you know, shared and found productive, is it really works with expanded definitions. Um, so the way the book defines celebrity is broad. The models on authorship discussed, but also demonstrated and engaged with and, 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 and kind of, you know, given to us as readers in the book um, are you know, extremely broad as well. And then the kinds of activities that are deemed to be activism are also diverse. And we've already talked about the diversity geographically, uh, racially, uh, historically uh, within the book. This is the, makes it a huge and ambitious and like really you know, kind of grand survey, I think. Um, so thank you. Um, the book makes a great case for, but also interrogates assumptions around the vital role of the artist and the creative in social change. And in this way, it's incredibly timely. It's a great record of, and in some places I think a love letter to, the social contribution of literary authors at a time when English and creative writing departments around the country, including in my own institution, are under threat. Uh, and yeah, that's where I would like to end and say thank you. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Simon to do the same. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'd just like to say a massive thank you uh, to the organisers uh, uh, for, for inviting me down. It, it's been a real pleasure to see this project come to fruition. And I feel I've kind of, I haven't, haven't got skin in the game here because I've been involved in the, in the conversations at Torch around uh, you know, this project almost from, from the start. Uh, but I don't actually have a contribution in the book. So it's a really sort of unalloyed pleasure really to, to just sort of see it all come out. And, and I was really thrilled uh, to see it happen and to, to get my, my copy because it's it's a fantastic project. And I think um, just to um, develop and am, uh, amplify what Hannah said, I think the, the, the real value of it is the way that it brings so many different um, authors, but also so many different time periods into conversation 
with one another and it, it really does, does give it a sort of broad application and interest I think for a really wide readership and, and, it, and it should be widely read. Um, it, it intersects with my own work in a number of different ways. Um, I'm, my first monograph was actually uh, on women's and gender history so that there are uh, obviously essays within the book that speak to um, women's authorship and the way that women particularly in the, in the 19th century uh, were able to use authorship to navigate the shoals of uh, public reputation and the damage that, that the wrong kind of public exposure could do to women, which has been a big, th you know, anybody who works on sort of women in public life in this period, that is an inevitable theme. Um, and I think that it's interesting to sort of see the developments across the, 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 the century, um, you know, the uh, essay uh, on Frances Burney, for example, uh, the very tentative steps that she took into uh, campaigning authorship around uh, securing support for the for the Catholic refugees from revolutionary France uh, and the you know really tentative steps because of the huge risks uh, that, that she ran um, for exposing herself too fully in, in the public sphere and that, uh, even as an established author and somebody that, that uh, had attained quite a lot of respect and then crossing the Atlantic and moving further forward in time uh, to look at uh, the author's who wrote under the pseudonyms Fanny Fern and, and Nellie Bly, and the way that they were able to use pseudonyms to kind of crawl out really from under that, the crushing weight of societal expectation around their gender uh, roles and, and what they should and shouldn't be doing in, in public. Which isn't to say, of course, that women weren't allowed to do anything in public. That's a sort of common misconception. And I think a lot, a lot of my first book was about what women could actually do. But there were still very firm boundaries uh, around their participation in, in the public sphere. Uh, and so one of the, th the things I really liked about the article, uh, or the, sorry, the chapter on, on, on uh, Fern and Bly is that getting around this idea that pseudonyms are always a negative thing, that they're a sort of uh, a way um, of you know, keeping women sort of in check. Uh, they can also be avenues of escape and avenues to, uh, to achieve more. Uh, and of course, Nellie Bly became a pioneering uh, investigative journalist um, in the United States in, in the late 19th century. The other aspect of the book that really kind of intersects with my work, particularly the more recent work I, I've done, uh, is around radical politics uh, around the same time. Uh, so my most recent monograph, uh, Celebrities, Heroes and Champions, looks at the way that uh, popular politicians, the people who were running the kind of extra parliamentary agitations like the Anti-Corn Law League, uh, like the, the Chartist movement, uh, and also the, the, the international anti-slavery movement, became celebrities uh, in their own right uh, at, at this time. And certainly the, the work of uh, you know, Kieran Hazard's uh, chapter on uh, James Silk Buckingham exposes a, a, a less well-known example of, of, of that genre and, and you know, someone who, who deserves to be better known. James Silk Buckingham is uh, a, an astonishing figure um, who manages to carve out a sort of niche for himself. Um, and I think that what Kieran does in that chapter is bring out the strategies by which uh, Buckingham did this. Because he's not alone, he's got to position himself in the marketplace. And I think this is the, another sort of aspect of uh, celebrity and authorship, that there has to be a market for it. There has to be uh, you know, work that sells at the end of the day. And this is part and parcel of this uh, negotiation of opportunity and threat that, that um, particularly in, 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 the, in the excerpt that, that Ruth read out, which is really sort of central to that uh, element of, of celebrity authorship. Uh, and Buckingham does it by sort of playing on uh, his experiences in India, uh, by positioning himself as a sort of orientalist sort of figure, uh, you know, dressing in exotic robes and things like that. And this helps to sort of set him apart from, from other people who are starting to occupy that literary radical campaigning uh, space in the 1830s, people like Edward Buller-Lytton, uh, and also to, to an extent Disraeli in his, with his sort of brief flirtation with, uh, with radicalism in the 1830s, uh, as uh, Sandra well knows. Um, so, you know, it really is sort of fascinating to, to look at that. But I think, as I say, one of the things that really um, appeals to me about this book is the fact that it brings in 
uh, the modern as well as the historical. Uh, as somebody who kind of you know, came to the, the history of celebrity in you know, about 20 years ago, really, when there wasn't really a lot written about the historicization, what, what was written were, were things by literary scholars like Leo Brody. Uh, but most of the sort of celebrity uh, studies, scholars in media studies, they had a very sort of dim idea about the history of the subject. And a lot of them said, oh, there's no such thing as celebrity before, you know, moving pictures and, uh, and things like that in the 1900s. Uh, so to bring those two things together here uh, is really exciting to, and to look at what um, historians can learn from modern celebrity examples and, and vice, you know, what modern celebrity studies can learn from looking at, at history uh, it is really, really vital. And I think that there are constants of, of that history. The, the contexts, of course, change, uh, but the constants are this sort of nexus of, of uh, you know, this equation of, of uh, you know, opportunity versus threat that we have to always navigate, um, uh, or that the authors always have to navigate, really. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic work. Um, and again, echoing uh, Hannah, I think it's an important social document as well, because it involves not just scholarly essays, but also conversations with real authors, some of whom, as we've heard, are sadly no longer with us. Uh, and I think that the book will be returned to um, as a social document, as well as uh, a, a great work of scholarship. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ruth and Sandra, would you like to respond at all uh, to, to anything that we've said so far? Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for this, you know, really attentive reading and for finding things that we didn't know we'd put in. I mean, I think I'd like to sort of pick up on that last point and just mention the writer's contributions, I think, get, you know. Um, Mina Kandasamy's forward, um, Kirsty ends the book and Kirsty Gunn kind of ends the book and, um, and we always wanted, I think, to allow writers to speak for themselves as well as to kind of like think about them critically because so much of this scholarship seems to kind of think of writers as like over there, like kind of zoo animals to be analysed. Um, <laughs> in a way which I think isn't necessarily kind of um, helpful or, or, you know, it doesn't kind of give you a complete picture. So that was always something that we were quite, quite keen on. Um, I was interested, there's this kind of conversation happening between the early 19th century and today, I think, just between the two of you. And that seemed to be kind of how it kept falling. And I don't know whether that's just because of where the kind of fields that we were coming out of um, but it does seem like this. I, I kept quoting Shelley in the introduction. I'm really sorry about that. Um, it was like, I'm going to have to talk about Shelley. Um, but I do think that there's something kind of exciting happens in the early 19th century. It's a time of transition. It's a time of new technology and media that means that it's really difficult to tell if anything is tr what's true and what isn't. And there does seem to be something there that speaks particularly urgently to today um, in that like in, in all the kind of changes and the, the sort of slightly apocalyptic feeling that sometimes creeps in. Sandra, do you want to say something more intelligent? I mean, it's of course a model. I mean, that's been enormously influential. Yeah? This Shelleyan model of the author as a, a truth teller and as a visionary. And uh, it's, it's, it's one that, uh, to come back to Benjamin Zephaniah, that he of course heavily draws on, you know, when he says in that interview, um, I'm a revolutionary. Yeah? And I mean, it's no coincidence that he participated in this program on Shelley uh, uh, that was done by the BBC, I think, to mark the, 200th anniversary of, of his death, yeah, um, and, and is very open about it, that this is a model, you know, that he's kind of, you know, taken as, a, um, yeah, as an example to follow in a, in a way. And uh, it, it's still there, I'd say it's, it's a cultural myth, it's a cultural template, yeah, um, but it's also one that uh, authors are very about yeah, these, these, these days for very good reasons. And it's also a model that is subject to um, misappropriation and uh, to abuse. Yeah? I mean, as you, as you can see in this chapter by Tori Rehm about 
Knut Hampson yeah, and, and what happens when the author is allowed to speak on behalf of the nation, as he says, yeah, um, which is, of course, an extreme example yeah, of the pitfalls of literary authority. Yeah. Kind of, kind of claiming or fetishizing this image of the author as, um, yeah, this, this, this truth-telling genius or this, this, this hero, yeah? um, and 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 it's something that, of course, periodically keeps coming up, and 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 that leads us into those conversations about the work versus the life, yeah, and whether it is really possible for literature to just sort of, you know, be this autonomous realm that is completely untouched or unsullied yeah, by political squabbles or, you know, its larger ramifications like genocide and, and, and the Holocaust. And uh, I mean, it reminded me of when the Austrian author Peter Handke received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2019. And it was immediately heavily criticized by writers, by members of the Penn organization for his uh, uh, support, very uncritical support of the uh, Serbian uh, uh, Milosevic regime. And uh, when he was confronted with those questions in the media, he would immediately kind of lean back and, and, and say, and, and, and kind of in a self-mythologizing gesture, resort to this myth of the white male author genius and say, uh, literally, I'm a writer. I come from Homer, Cervantes, Tolstoy. Uh, leave me alone with these questions. Yeah? I mean, kind of something, I'm just not answerable to the public and, and the media. Um, so I think that's also something that comes out yeah, in, in, in these conversations and in the case studies. Yeah? This is where the conversations and the case studies very nicely come together uh, in this book. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the thing, right? That, rad that romantic idea that's emerging from Shelley. That I so, sort of used to tell undergrads that like, the defense of poetry is still the best kind of attack that you have against people who want to attack the humanities. Like <laughs> that idea that it's, it's such a good articulation of why literature matters. And presumably everyone here does believe that it matters. Otherwise, I don't know why you'd be here on like a Wednesday <laughs> afternoon. But, um, but at the same time, it feels like something that's very dangerous if you just kind of uncritically accept it, as Sandra says, yeah. that it gives this kind of unqualified power to writers um, and it defines kind of good writing in such a circular way that you know if it's if it's great literature then it does good politics um, and if it doesn't do good politics then somehow it's not great literature and so you can just keep kind of working around that in a really in a way which leaves so much space for bad things to happen. I think it's such an important question if, you know you say can it be unsullied but if it could would those then be people had any connection to the world to sh change it um, and comment on it? I mean, Simon, sorry, let's um, bring you. Do you want to respond to any of that? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, you know, see that the, you know, as a historian, it's natural to want to put all of these things into context. And uh, I think one of the things that, that sort of comes through the historicized examples in particular is the, the role of contingency uh, in all of this, the role of, um, you know, sure, there is agency. There, are, you, know, you have to be able to take advantage of opportunities that that are presented to you. Uh, and some of those opportunities, though, are to do with changing technologies uh, of, of fame. Um, uh, coming back to, to Buckingham, that you know, he he came along at precisely the moment the lecture circuit starts to explode in the eighteen thirties and forties. There are suddenly many more venues in towns and cities across the country where you can actually go and give a literary reading, or you can go and talk about your, your latest radical political campaign, or or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that uh, all those, those things are always sort of in tension, aren't they, with um, you know, the, the author's individuality and, and uh, you know, the medium by which they can express themselves is constantly changing. And we see that obviously today with the, the movement of, sort of social media and, and uh, you know, new spaces for, for debate and discussion. But every time there is a change like that, again, those opportunities and threats are, are still there. Um, you know, social media on the one hand is a great democratizing tool, but on the other hand, it's so easily manipulated and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you said about individuality and the thing that kind of came across most strongly, poss possibly because we were working on this book in like our little rooms, <laughs> sort of spread out using our Google Drive and not really seeing very many people, but it's about personality to an extent which is really not 
how you kind of a good historicist kind of thinks about these things you think you're going to carve it up into like boxes based on gender and race and kind of categories of identity and then like this is the context and so they'll behave like this but the point about most of the people in this book is that they're not going to act in the ways that are expected of them in those contexts because of they are almost by definition kind of exceptional personalities and so that really kind of to me challenged how I was thinking about categories of identity. James Hall Buckingham is, you know, who is, I fell in love with a little bit. Um, <laughs> he could have just been a kind of conventional middle-class white, you know, colonial figure who did the things that were much more conventional. And he, the fact that he doesn't is really difficult to pin down why. It's something to do with character. And it's something to do with individual personality. And that's kind of one of the fun things about writing about celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. It's this cast of mad people. Of big, big, big figures, mad, big, yeah. interesting people. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's obviously, it's big figures, it's, it's individuals, but of course, I mean, talking about agency, I mean, that agency is always embedded. I mean, it's always situated. It's always in dialogue with industry frameworks, with media frameworks, with the market, needless to say. And I think something that's also been very important to us, so the voice of the author was very important, but of course also bringing in the people who are part of the literary marketplace. Yeah? And so we've had wonderful conversations, yeah? I mean, and getting them into dialogue. So that was the important thing, not just hearing from them individually and how they might conceive of their work as a form of activism. So translators, curators, educators, prize judges. Yeah? So, yeah. And we, we actually tried to bring them together and to talk to each other. And I think, you know, that for me has been one of the most sort of eye-opening things coming out of the book, yeah? that we had these conversations here yeah? about how all these things come together and how you work within the constraints of the literary marketplace, but where you could still kind of carve out kind of niches for yourself. Yeah? And I mean, if you are a translator, for instance, I mean, choosing to translate the work of um, a marginalized figure or a marginalized literary voice, I mean, you know, there is a political, a great political power inherent to that, or um, recommending someone for a literary prize, or making sure new literary voices get published in, 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 in a journal, for instance. Huh? Um, so also having those conversations yeah, about what it means to be in those gatekeeping, uh, politically important positions in a way. So that was really important to us as well. And I think that is often something that's sort of missing, the particular that emphasis on gatekeepers. And if you look at the, the kind of Leo Brody sort of democratization of fame narrative, it doesn't really sort of address that, that question. It's, it's this sort of nice linear uh, sort of progression, uh, you know, people, the, the, who controls, uh, you know, it moves from, from, the, from the courts controlling who becomes famous and then it just becomes democratic. Well, it doesn't because there are all those gatekeepers. And, and the and intermediaries of one form or another, because not all of them have keys to the gate, but there's still hands that touch and shape along the way. And the money. Like, yeah. we could have written another book about the economics of this and what it means I mean, when so often when you're looking at 19th century writers there's a key bit where they get an income from somewhere like someone dies and leaves them some money or was like a patron kind of goes oh we're going to give you an income and that's where it changes will you write that other book probably not <laughs> uh, <laughs> i just have to learn more about economics um but it's so key and what does it mean that today that authors are getting paid less and less and less and new authors in particular are getting paid not enough to live on what does that do to the kind of questions in the book about agency and who gets to write and who gets to have um, this visibility now before we open up to the floor can i just ask you to explain to us the origin of the project the seminar series of the book because you described briefly the, you know that it's the, a 10-year journey so um could you talk us through that evolution and at what stage did you have this as it looks now in mind um did that you know is it something that evolved throughout those 10 years of work do you want to so i i came here on a postdoc like 400 years ago no 10 <laughs> 10 years ago something like that um and 
there are some people here who were like there at the time. So sorry, I didn't mean you were old. I'm old. <laughs> don't mean you were. Um, and that was um, on a part of it was setting up a celebrity research network in Oxford. Um, and that was how I met Sandra, who came from Vienna and kind of spent some time. That's how and, we met. And yeah. you and many other people here. Um, and you came and you were looking at Disraeli. I heard there was a celebrity research network in Oxford, so I thought well, I have to come. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean that was that was certainly um, a, a game changer. I mean, in those days, as, as as you were saying before, there were not too many people working on the history of celebrity. It was kind of considered a bit of a frivolous subject, let's say, dangerously uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, absolutely, and and I mean, you you were obviously telling me these stories about uh, college dinner table conversations, people sort of raising your. Oh, their eyebrows. There were certain, like, when, yeah, when I first got here, there were some people who were fairly horrified by the idea. Um, or they thought I was going to write a book about how bad celebrity was. <laughs> yes, and, like, I've been invited to write that one so, so many, many of times, those, right? and I won't. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, how do we aren't get rid of... Aren't they yucky? Aren't they revolting <laughs> celebrity? Yes. Let's, how do we go back to writing for courts? Um, <laughs> but, and then at some point, you... Oh, Sandra's been kind of leading the way on this and I get kind of swept up in the slipstream because I wasn't really writing about famous writers. Um, my first book was on literature about celebrity rather than kind of literary celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, but you... So I, I think, I think you, you mentioned Disraeli. So I think that was the kind of case study that got me to Oxford and, and I kind of worked on the intersections of literature and politics with Disraeli and the wider networks and kind of that led on to, um, you know, talking about the intersections between literature and politics in a more general way and doing a kind of cross historical cross period study because as you said, I think this is where uh, the kind of interesting bits lie. Yeah? I mean, making a sort of explore continuities, ruptures, similarities and uh, yeah, and I mean, it's all led to a symposium in 2016. So I should say we had support from the Oxford Centre for Life Writing. Um, I should, I'm not just saying that just because Elika sat right there. Um, <laughs> but we had support from, uh, yeah, from Wolfson and um, from Torch, the Austrian and from Torch, obviously, who were always there and uh, the Austrian Science Fund um, kind of together over various bits kind of um, supported the project. The idea was that there would be this kind of lead up of shorter symposiums and then this big two day conference. Um, and then the two day conference obviously didn't happen at the last minute. Um, so eventually after kind of picking ourselves up, we, Sandra organized um, for most of the contributors, most of the people who were going to kind of come to the conference to instead give webinars over the course of that summer. So we just kind of moved everything onto Zoom. And what happened then was what had been a kind of relatively sort of limit, what we thought of as kind of a relatively niche audience, um, got much bigger because the Zoom webinar. I don't know like whether people at that point were still quite open to the idea of like, let's do, let's watch stuff online. Um, so we had a much more international kind of audience then and we had some more people kind of come and say they were interested. And then Bloomsbury said, do you want to do a book? Good on Bloomsbury. So we Thank did. you, Bloomsbury. <laughs> okay, um, it's time to open out to the floor now. I also want to open out that to Simon as well because I did promise him, I knew, I knew that he would have questions. Um, for our authors? Well, I suppose uh, I, it's kind of two-parter, I suppose, which is a really awful thing to do. Um, one is this kind of, where next? Are, are you going to sort of take this project on anywhere? And which the second question may be related to that first one, or it may not. Uh, how do we address the, the missing part of the triumvirate? If we think about the way that, that um, we often think about celebrity as being the, the nexus between an audience and an industry and an individual. Where is the audience in all this and, and how do we address that? Because that is actually, so certainly in historical terms, it's the most difficult one to access of the three of those. That's great. I'm going to invite you to answer that as quickly as you can so that we can keep space um, for audience questions as well. But where, is the, yeah, where is the audience? They have 12 minutes. So, uh, yeah, you can keep your answer, that answer brief. Well, I, 
I'm no longer in academia. Um, 10 years of precarity being enough. Um, so I'm only doing research in a very, very sort of small amateur way. Um, so these are two big questions for me. I'm going back to the 18th century, um, possibly. Um, but yeah, the question of the audience, I mean, what I'm interested in at the moment is how is the concept of celebrity understood by the wider, I guess, audience by people in general. So I'm kind of looking at the way that fame appears in fiction and celebrity appears in fiction and trying to get a sense from that of like how these questions are understood. But that has to happen at the weekend. <laughs> so, Sandra? Yeah, I mean, life is unpredictable. I might still have a few more years in academia. We'll, we'll see, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's taken me down some unexpected routes, like uh, doing a digital edition of uh, autobiographical material by W.H. Auden, um, which is also interesting, uh, but uh, it's got less of those intersections between literature and politics. Uh, obviously, I would like to um, pursue this project a little bit further also with a view to life writing. Yeah, so take a look at how autobiographical genres sort of mirror those transactions between literature and politics. And uh, yeah, this is definitely something where I would like to pick up, I mean, your suggestion and uh, try to, you know, spotlight potential audiences, yeah? I mean, this is something that you do in, in, in your work yeah. on the celebrity memoir and, and yeah. ghostwriting and gender. Yeah? Yeah. Also trying to look at what kind of impact does that have? Yeah? And yes. it has an enormous one, as you as you said, Absolutely. especially with, with that new book that's going to come out. Which yes, well, that one is actually all, all derived from interviewing yeah. the audiences Wonderful. Um, and asking how they define celebrity. And, you, you know, unsurprisingly, the boundaries are extremely fuzzy. You say who is their leader and they're just as likely to say, well, Emma Watson did this great campaign as they are to say, well, you know, Nicola Sturgeon handled the pandemic like this. You know, it, it's, they don't make that distinction. They judge by what is being done. Yeah. Um, so celebrity in audiences' minds is much more nebulous, um, of course. Anyway, to the audience, speaking of audiences, yes, we'll go here first and then to you, sir. That's a great question because, of course, they're already collectivised, mobilised, have a shared identity, which social movement theory has shown is so important um, for anything to happen. Um, does anyone want to speak? Yeah. I mean, you're thinking of Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, yeah. For example. I mean, I think it's, there is a, an enormous amount of quite fierce debate about the word fan mm. and how, to what extent that can actually apply to the sort of 18th, 19th century relationship with an individual or with, um, uh, with literature. Um, and I'm not sure, I think I fall on the side of actually it can't. It provides this way of understanding this historical shift in the way that kind of the relationship between a reader and a writer is understood or a reader and a famous person is understood. That said, I think it's, it does really sharpen the, that sense of kind of the power that celebrity could give you as a as a writer or as a, a famous person, but also the kind of danger behind it, that sense that people that you don't know might be kind of doing things in your name that you have no control over. There's that kind of Frankenstein kind of aspect to it, right? That really it, it does kind of apply to people like Byron, potentially. Um, that's a bit of a wobbly answer. Do you have yeah. anything else? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you're kind of putting your finger on a bit of a blind spot. I mean, you know, don't want to be sort of self undermining. Yeah? But I mean, this is definitely a really interesting question that needs to be explored. I mean, um, what you can see with, with, with writers and the, and the kind of uh, celebrity capital or, or attention capital that they wield is um, it, it's effective because they manage to reach audiences beyond their core readership yeah? and, and, and beyond the people who kind of, you know, regularly or usually buy their books, yeah? which, is, which is kind of what gives them, yeah? this I mean, kind of political power. Yeah, I mean, even further yeah. than that, literary celebrity is sort of interesting because literary celebrity yeah. is the only version that kind of so furiously 
disclaims its own fans, mm. right? Like a lot of writers really don't want to have fans or they don't want to have people who call themselves fans or are seen in that way. Like Sitsi Dangaremba, the anecdote that sort of starts the book is this exchange on Twitter where, or X, um, where someone says, you're, a, you know, you're one of our celebrities. We have celebrities and you're one of them. And she goes, no, 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 I'm not. Um, and I think there's a lot of writers that you could point to who if you sat them down and said, like, what do you think of your fans? They would go, I don't have fans. I have people who, you know, appreciate my writing. I think it's also hard to answer because we don't want to speak for fans without yeah. speaking to fans. So in a sense, it would be its own other fantastic project that yeah. you guys should also add to the list of fantastic future directions this can't go. Do you, do you want to add to that before I...? Well, just very briefly, I, mean, I think the, the, the issue with fans is, of course, and I think this goes for rock bands as well as for, for literary authors, that, that they tend to want more of the same. So I suppose that that's a kind of limitation on your, your freedom of, of action when it comes to writing your next project. And I suppose in the 19th century, Arthur Conan Doyle is probably the person who suffers most famously from this because he wants to kill off Sherlock Holmes and his fans won't let him. <laughs> well, they, they sort of make him bring him back. Um, uh, in terms of fandoms, in terms of ha having these sort of communities uh, uh, of people, I'm not sure if I can think of any sort of direct analogies. I guess the, the anti-slavery movement had these sort of, you know, little sort of factions or, uh, that coalesced around individual personalities because the, the movement itself was so fissured in, in, uh, in, in the mid 19th century uh, and it was transatlantic and there were, you know, people who followed Lord William Lloyd Garrison and people who followed Frederick Douglass and people who followed the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. And they tended to coalesce around individual personalities because there were no overarching institutional structures to hold, to hold the movement together. So I suppose that's the nearest in, in, in the things that I've worked on. It's a topic which is particularly kind of difficult to bring down to like, here are some <laughs> statistics on, you know, this is the change that has been made by X writer on this particular demographic. Because you can't do that, you can't do that now on living audiences with any kind of degree of reliability. If you wanted to say kind of what's, what influence, let's measure the influence that Salman Rushdie has had on living audiences, it would be extremely challenging to do that. You could do some surveys, I guess, and kind of ask people, you know, did you change your mind about anything when you read Salman Rushdie? Um, but it would at best give you a kind of, I mean, I'm sure these are challenges that, with which you're extremely well aware, um, but it's at best going to give you some very contradictory and complicated data to interpret. When you start kind of going further back into history, I mean, what impact does Francis Burney have on the debate about refugees and emigres in, from the French Revolution? Um, if we can't get a kind of straight answer from living audiences, it's extremely difficult to get a straight answer from dead ones, right? Um, so you kind of, by definition, have to take this piecemeal approach. Um, you have to do some analysis of text. We have a bunch of different approaches. We have Ellen Wales' kind of um, more ethnographic approach, um, but it's, it's something which kind of requires that more flexible open approach of, of uh, humanities scholars. I I was, yeah, I mean, when I invited you to talk about it, I was thinking about the breadth of um, modes that the book um, displays. It's, um, it's really broad, I think, in its uh, approaches um, methodologically and the kinds of sources, right? What the book doesn't have in, because it would have had to make it much longer, is much about like people who are celebrities and then go yeah. into writing, which obviously is kind of huge that you've written yeah. about yeah, yeah, quite yeah, a yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, huge. Um, um, that, that actually was something that we made a conscious decision kind of to go, okay, well, this isn't something we can kind of cover in any depth. So we don't want to just sort of do a little bit and then run away. We want to kind of focus on the idea of like, when you write a book, what celebrity do you get from that? Or like, what can you add to that? Um, I think it's, it's really interesting, that question of kind of um, writers trying to seize control of the means of production, right? <laughs> like, um, there is a 
attention that you can see throughout the book from all sorts of people in terms of kind of going, well, there's so many constraints in terms of yeah. what I'm allowed to do um, within a marketplace, as Simon was saying, within kind of institutions, how do I gain independence and self-expression? And that's something that um, has happened kind of at lots of different times throughout history as well. Like you see writers kind of creating their own presses all the way through the 19th and 20th century. And there's, of course, a wonderful continuity there, as you say. I mean, we have this wonderful conversation in the book between Kirsty Gunn and uh, David Graham, uh, who, of course, come to this question uh, of the publishing scene and how is the writer positioned there from two completely opposite directions. Yeah, I mean, you have the writer uh, who's uncomfortable, let's say, yeah, with those conditions in which uh, they have to operate. And on the other hand, of course, there's the economic side of things. Yeah? And uh, it's very interesting when uh, David says, I think, towards the end of this conversation, um, he's, he's uh, kind of proposing an awareness of the market and of uh, the economics of it. Don't be a slave to the market, but be aware of it because it also allows you yeah, to do the kind of writing that you want to do and find, uh, as you were saying, different different options. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of stuff happening in the publishing scene and great transformations happening there. And uh, as a writer, um, I suppose there is no other way but be aware of these things that are happening. And I think she also he mentioned self-publishing, yeah, which is, of course, also something that a lot of writers uh, do these days yeah, as, as, as something that potentially allows them to um, have a greater amount of freedom to do what they want to do. I feel like with the Stormzy example, I'm less familiar with Lena Dunham, but uh, it's um, also seen as part of his social justice work. Right. It's it's not um, it's you know, it, it's one of many narratives around Stormzy about him giving back. Um, and um, and I guess I guess it speaks directly to all the questions we were saying earlier about the gatekeepers and who gets to be those gatekeepers, especially, of course, because Stormzy is specifically recruiting and seeking to platform writers of color. Right? And so the act of doing that is in itself progressive and radical and revolutionary, almost sort of independent of the content of, the, of what was being yeah. published. But then, of course, as a model, yeah. it's not, there's nothing inherently progressive about that. It could be, you know, it could just be another means to offer the keys to the already wealthy yeah, and privileged exactly. and so forth. Because there's the money. Yeah. And, and what does it mean for further kind of movement in the publishing industry if the only way to kind of set up that kind of press is to it's become to incredibly famous be and rich in yeah. another sphere. It's not the answer, is it? Did you want to respond to Stormzy and Lena Dunham? <laughs> I have to say, this is slightly out of my comfort zone. But um, no, I, I mean, the, the, it, as Sandra has, has, has said, I think it's something that's gone on um, for a long time that sort of marginalised voices you know, tend to try and take control of the of the process. And you can see it with the sort of early women's movement in in the you know, the eighteen fifties when they kind of set up the Victoria Press and start to. Uh, you know, produce their own work. So yeah, it, it's something that, that continually happens. But yeah, it, I think that the, the point Hannah makes is an excellent one about uh, it's not just who holds the keys, it's who holds the, uh, the purse strings. Absolutely. All right, well, I'm afraid it is now two o'clock. So I have to thank um, heartily our authors um, and um, Simon, our respondent, and, uh, um, and thank you very much for inviting me to chair. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's really nice to have a full room. And thanks to Torch um, for hosting. Um, what is it? Yeah, uh, uh, and, and, you know, they've, they've been there throughout the whole thing. And this is a great kind of moment of fruition. So thank you all for making today a great session. Thank you.